Hello, BookTube. For reasons that are a little bit unclear to me, I appear to be doing a chapter-by-chapter read-through of J.R.R. Tolkien's Lord of the Rings, and I could not be happier about that fact. <laughs> I started out with just a, a sort of buddy read with David Riley and uh, Tony of An Erudite Adventure of The Two Towers, but uh, Tony has moved on to The Return of the King, and so am I. I am reading The, two, the, the Return of the King now. We are reading it together chapter by chapter. You seem to be enjoying it, even though I think a lot of you have already read this book many times before, as have I. Never really thought about doing this before, but I'm having a blast, and it's doing this kind of a slow crawl through a book inevitably makes you think of new things, makes you wonder and ask new questions, which is always a lot of fun. And uh, there are two narratives in The Return of the King, starting in The Two Towers, but in The, in the Return of the King there are two separate narratives. They're completely untouched to each other although they do have distant effects on each other. One is all of our heroes fighting a land war against Sauron, the Lord of the Rings, the Dark Lord of Mordor, who has a huge amount of terrestrial forces at his command, evil south Southlanders, uh, corrupted men, monsters of all kinds, and his eyes are turned on the great kingdom of Gondor, the great kingdom of men of Gondor, and its capital city of Minas Tirith. That's one plot line. That war which has now reached a fever pitch in the part of the book that we're, that we're looking at today. I'm actually going to take you through two chapters today, side by side, because there's really no reason to separate them. Uh, and that is the hammer blow of the forces of Mordor landing on Minas Tirith. That's one plot line. There's an entirely different plot line involving the hobbit Frodo and his servant Sam and the creature Gollum who are walking their way in, they have walked their way into Mordor. Frodo and Sam are on a mission to take the one ring of power, that thing right there, one ring to rule them all, and throw it into the molten fires where Sauron made it, the only place on Middle-earth where it can be destroyed. They don't just want to hide it or keep it from his grasp. They want to destroy it. And that is far more important a quest. That's far more important a plotline than the other plotline. All the characters that know about this, this quest, the second quest, admit that what they're doing is essentially a distraction. They're trying to draw Sauron's attention away from his own kingdom to give that quest a chance to work. But when we're in the one plotline, we don't know anything about the other plotline. Tolkien keeps them almost completely separate. And we are at the climax of the first plotline in Return of the King. That war, the, the forces of war investing and laying siege to Minas Tirith. We're at the climax of this now. Now, the action continues in, in later chapters. We're not done with this section of the book, but this is, this is the climax, and it involves a character, the, the main thing from uh, one of the two chapters that we're dealing with today is a character that we've met and come to know fairly well, King Theoden, who is the king of, of the kingdom of Rohan, which was... Uh, a subsidiary of Gondor, the land was given to the Rohirrim by the, the men of Gondor, and it has been a long-time ally. And word has, we have we have spoken to a lot of men of Gondor in the current part of the book who just keep looking at, at the horizon and wondering if Rohan will appear. When will the riders of Rohan get here? Will they lift the siege? Will they save us from these forces investing the city? I confess, that's always been a little odd to me. Uh, that note has always been a little odd to me. Why the, these Gondorian soldiers are constantly looking for the riders of Rohan in their hour of struggle. I always want to ask, where are the forces of Gondor? Not where is Rohan. Rohan is a subsidiary kingdom. It's, it's a much lesser and weaker kingdom than Gondor. Why doesn't Gondor have 100,000 men ready at all times? Especially since they've been sort of poised on the edge of Sauron's kingdom for all this time. I, I'm not. I'm not 100% sure why they so badly need rescuing here in the uh, in the climax. But as we saw the last time, it makes for a heck of a climax, whether there's a reason behind it or not, whether it makes good sense or not. It makes for a heck of a climax. The leader of Sauron's forces attacking Minas Tirith is the Lord of the Nazgul, the who was once upon a time the Witch King of Angmar, fighting against the men of Westerness hundreds and hundreds of years ago. He is now the lord of the, the Shadow Riders, who are Sauron's foremost servants. And he is mounted on a winged beast, not a horse anymore. And he is leading the charge, so to speak. He is, he is the one who's responsible for breaking down the, grit, the gate of Minas Tirith. And in that climactic moment that we saw last time, 
he enters the gate of Minas Tirith, which no enemy has ever done before, and everyone is fleeing before him. He is not just a mighty commander of an invading army. He's a supernatural being on a supernatural creature. The only thing standing in his path is the reborn Gandalf the White on Shadowfax, and it's a confrontation. Gandalf very consciously echoes the lines that he says to the Balrog in the Fellowship of the Ring, which is that you, you can't pass here. Go. Go back to the shadow. And we expect, maybe the first time we're reading this, we expect that what will follow will be a confrontation, just like with the Balrog. I think there's no doubt that Gandalf the White could have handled the Balrog fairly easily. And I would, like many readers, I would love to have seen the confrontation between him and the Witch King of Angmar, the lead servant of Sauron. But it doesn't happen. Because just as it's about to happen, the, the horn of, of the Rohirrim sounds. The Rohirrim have arrived. They have arrived to rescue Gondor and to lift the siege. They have arrived to attack the forces of Sauron in the rear. And those of you who know Lord of the Rings from Peter Jackson's movies instead of from the books, or maybe in addition to the books, will know that moment. <laughs> you will know that moment if you don't remember anything else from Lord of the Rings you will remember because the ride of the Rohirrim in Peter Jackson's The Lord of the Rings is a great piece of cinema. It is a fantastic three minutes of film, just utterly fantastic. Uh, and it mirrors a lot of what's of, of the moments in the chapters that we're reading today, but not accurately. The, 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 the actual action in the book is very different. It mirrors, for instance, accurately, the fact that when King Theoden sees Gondor besieged, he is crestfallen. He is amazed. This is the greatest city in Middle-earth. It's the greatest city in his world. And it is invested inside and outside with the forces of the enemy. It looks like it's minutes away from complete destruction. That moment is captured well in the movie, and it's captured well in the book. Uh, but in the movie, Peter Jackson seems intent on giving King Theoden a lot more of a Hollywood ending, a much bigger ending. Uh, he does a lot more in the movie in these scenes than he does in the book. But what he does in the book has a grandeur that no movie can capture. And I, I want to, that's the first thing that I want to read you here. And it's the only thing I want to read you from uh, the first of the two chapters that we're dealing with, which is, which is the Ride of the Rohirrim, which is basically just the, the story of the Riders of Rohan getting to Gondor. It has some interesting bits in it. They meet an indigenous little people, an indigenous sort of American Indian style tribe of people. Stone Age type of people. We don't learn anything about them at all. We don't learn anything about their lore. They don't, they speak the common tongue, but only roughly, and they don't want any part of the war except to help in the destruction of orcs, much like the Ents. Only they don't appear to be supernatural beings like the Ents. Uh, but aside from that, we don't get anything other than just the, the forces of Rohan getting to Gondor. And they do at the end of the chapter called The Ride of the Rohan. And King Theoden and his men see what the state of affairs is in Gondor, and they get ready, they get close, and then they charge. And we get this great, great passage that Tolkien is taking straight from Sir Walter Scott. Uh, Suddenly the king cried to Snowmane, and the horse sprang away. Behind him his banner blew in the wind, white horse upon a field of green, but he outpaced it. After, he th after him thundered the knights of his house, but he was ever before them. Aermer, that's his nephew, uh, rode there, the white horsetail of his helm floating in his speed, and the front of the first Aerid roared like the breaker foaming to the shore, but Theoden could not be overtaken. Fay he seemed, or the battle fury of his fathers ran like new fire in his veins, and he was borne upon Snowmane like a god of old, even as Orome the Great in battle of the Valar when the world was young. His golden shield was uncovered, and lo, it shone like an image of the sun, and the grass flamed into green about the white feet of his steed. For morning came, morning and a wind from the sea, and darkness was removed, and the host of mortal wailed, and terror took them, and they fled and died, and the hoofs of wrath rode over them. And then all the host of Rohan burst into song, and they sang as they slew, for the joy of battle was on them, and the sound of their singing was fair and terrible, and fair and terrible came even to the city. Listen to the diction of that. All those those very King Jamesian and this and that and the other thing. Those those virtually undiagrammable sentences of rolling epic grandeur. 
that is just amazing. Absolutely amazing. And Theoden fights his way against the human uh, forces that are attacking Gondor and slays their captain before he himself is attacked by the winged beast on which rides the Witch King of Angmar, the, the leader of the Nazgul. It grabs his horse and her, his horse falls onto Theoden, crushing his body. Uh, which was in the in the age of horseborne combat, that was the number one fear. That was an, the number one danger was not the arrows of the enemy or the spear thrusts of the enemy or whatnot. It was that your horse would fall on you and crush your body underneath it. Uh, and that happens to Theoden when he is confronted with this creature, which lands on the ground to grab onto the dead body of of Snowman Theoden's horse, and we get a description of the creature that is in excess. Tolkien has already described this creature. He describes it in this paragraph. He goes into a little bit of excess here. This is another instance where I am strongly detecting Robert E. Howard. I am strongly detecting the pulps. Because he, in just a quick gesture, he gives this creature a little bit of very Conan-esque history. This passage, if you plucked it out of The Return of the King and put it in the Tower of the Elephant, I really don't think that it would stand out. I don't think you'd be able to know. Uh, he says of the creature... It, the, a creature of an older world, maybe it was, whose kind, lingering in forgotten mountains, cold beneath the moon, outstayed their day, and in hideous irie bred their last untimely brood, apt to evil. <laughs> All right, granted, that's probably a little bit more eloquent than, than Robert E. Howard could ever have, ever have but nevertheless, uh, it's a great description of this creature, which is getting ready to you know, feast on on the unconscious or the barely conscious king when one warrior stands in the way. Now, again, if you've seen Peter Jackson's movies, you know this story already because the warrior, it turns out to be Eowyn who has gone to war under a pseudonym. She has gone to war in disguise rather than be left at home to caretake her people. We've already seen the scene in which she rails against that fate to Aragorn who blandly complacently tells her, no, I'm sorry. Your place is here. She won't accept that. And neither will Mary, the hobbit, who is with her. They both go to war against the orders of their superiors. They both want to fight. They both want to do the right thing instead of sitting around waiting to be rescued. And this is Eowyn's moment. She confronts the Lord of the Nazgul, who uh, warns her that no man may kill him. This is an old prophecy that, that uh, is bestowed on him by a character from the Silmarillion. This is, this is an old prophecy that he is relying on. And when she reveals that she's actually not a man, so that the prophecy maybe technically doesn't apply to her, even though she's completely human and he's not, he pauses. And in his pause, Mary, the hobbit, we didn't read this part because we didn't go through chapter by chapter the Fellowship of the Ring. But in the Fellowship of the Ring, Mary is equipped with a, a, a very old dagger from the Barrow Downs of Hobbiton, from the Shire that is not a, a Hobbit product, of course. It's from, it's from Numenor. It's from Westermass. It's a very old, powerful weapon. And when the, uh, the Lord of the Nazgul is looming over Eowyn, she has, she has tried to fight, and it, she, he's too much. When he's looming over her and completely distracted, Mary stabs him with that sword. And then Eowyn stabs him in the open air where his face would be, and he is destroyed. The, the whole of the battlefield uh, hears the hideous cry of this shapeless being as it dies. Uh, we're told shapeless they lay now, on, his, his uh, mantle and hauberk are empty. Shapeless they lay now on the ground, torn and tumbled, and a cry went up into the shuddering air and faded to a shrill wailing, passing with the wind, a voice bodiless and thin that died and was swallowed up and was never heard again in that age of this world. Uh, and that's heard in the city as well. In the next chapter, Gandalf hears that very cry. Everyone does. This, this is an amazing victory that Eowyn and Mary have, these two people who were not supposed to go to war, were in the perfect position to make. They have achieved an incredible victory. They have killed the Lord of the Nazgul. Uh, and uh, it comes too late for Theoden. He is dead, or is dying. He knows that. In the movie, he gets to have his final scene with Eowyn. In the book, he doesn't know that she has de that she has defied him. He doesn't know that she's gone that he she's gone to war. He still says something along the lines of his great line that in that I go down to my fathers in whose mighty company I shall not now be ashamed. Uh, 
and then he passes away. And Mary is wondering, where is Gandalf? Why isn't he here? Why couldn't he have stopped this? Uh, and he looks around for his sword. He's on the battlefield. No one's paying any attention to him. The battle is still raging, even though the Lord of the Nazgul has been overthrown. He looks around for his sword. He sees it, but it is dissolving. It has been destroyed by its its great victory over this, this uh, Lord of the Nazgul. And we get a fantastic paragraph here. Uh, so passed the sword of the Barrow Downs, work of Westerness. But glad would he have been to know its fate who wrought it slowly long ago in the North Kingdom when the Dunedain were young. And chief among their foes was the dread realm of Angmar and its sorcerer king. No other blade, not though mightier hands had wielded it, would have dealt that foe a wound so bitter, cleaved the undead flesh, breaking the spell that knit his unseen sinews to his will. Which is pretty interesting in a way. Uh, it 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 kind of indicates that the, it kind of takes a little bit of the of the glow off Eowyn's triumph, uh, because it, it it makes it sound as though that blow from Mary is the thing that killed, or at least made the Lord of the Nazgul killable. It's a teamwork thing, though, and uh, the blade dies, but Mary and Mary and uh, Eowyn are the ones who save the day. They're the ones who win this incredible victory on the field, even though Theoden is dead, and it looks like Eowyn is dying. Her her kinsman, Aemer, is astounded when, he's, when he finds her on the battlefield. Remember, she's taken her helmet off so he can easily identify her. He's astounded. He is driven to an unbelievable killing rage along with uh, along with all of the rest of the Rohirrim. They're driven to a killing rage when they find that. I wonder if I can find uh, that passage. Uh Yes, he says, Eowyn, Eowyn, he cried at last. Eowyn, how come you here? What madness or deviltry is this? Death, 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 take us all. Then, without taking counsel or waiting for the approach of the men of the city, he spurred headlong back to the front of a great host and blew a horn and cried aloud for the onset. Over the field rang his clear voice calling, Death, ride, ride to ruin and the world's ending. And his men just ride off. In fact, they ride a little too impetuously. Uh, but... Although they seem beset, they, they outrun their support and they, they are facing a stiff opposition, including from normal humans, not necessarily from orcs or trolls, when it looks like they might have bitten off more than they can chew and they, this might be the end, suddenly relief comes from ships on the river, from ships coming from the bay, from ships that are supposed to be full of, of southern pirates. This is the sudden blow that Aragorn saw in the Palantir when he wrested it from control of Sauron. He got a glimpse of some of Sauron's plans, and one of them was to send Corsairs to the city from another direction, a pincer movement, a sudden heavy blow that Gondor is not prepared for. And when everybody sees these ships coming, they think, oh no. So in addition to everything else, we have this, and they are on the brink of despair until a banner unfurls. And it is the banner that the Dunedain brought to Aragorn. It was it was constructed in Rivendell by Aragorn's beloved, and it is his own banner. It is very much the banner of men. It is the banner of the kingdom of Gondor. Uh, and at that moment, the tide of battle is locked in favor of the good guys. They've already won a massive victory. The Rohirrim arrived just in time. Eowyn and Merry managed to, to, to destroy the captain of the Nazgul. But then we get Aragorn arriving. Then everybody realizes that the day has been saved by the very thing that looked like it was going to ruin everything. And we get this passage. Thus came Aragorn, son of Arathon, Elisar, Isildur's heir, out of the pass of the dead, born upon a wind from the sea to the kingdom of Gondor. And the mirth of the Rohirrim was a torrent of laughter and a flashing of swords. And the joy and wonder of the city was a music of trumpets and a ringing of bells. But the host of Mordor were seized with bewilderment, and a great wizardry it seemed to them that their own ships should be filled with their foes. And a black dread fell upon them, knowing that the tides of fate had turned against them, and their doom was at hand. Uh, and that ends the chapter which is called The Battle of the Pelennor Fields, and which is essentially the action climax of this one plotline of Return of the King. And we are moving on. We move on in the next chapter to a chapter called The Pyre of Denethor. And the chapter, The Pyre of Denethor, answers Mary's question. Mary the Hobbit on the battlefield, seeing all this, this, this chaos, seeing this supernatural being 
coming against them and destroying King Theoden, asks a very natural question. Where is Gandalf? <laughs> Where is Gandalf? What, this is exactly why we need a wizard and he's not here. Well, in the next chapter, we learn where he is. We learn what stopped him from going down to the battlefield, as he fully intended to do, to, con to contend with the Lord of the Nazgul, which is, as he says about the Balrog, a foe beyond any of you, while the forces of Rohan are fighting for Gondor. That had been his intent. Something stops him from coming to the battlefield. And in the next chapter, we learn what that is. So there you have uh, a, a sort of mush together, the ride of the Rohan and the battle of the Pelennor fields, because they kind of go together in the book. But we'll move on to the next chapter in this weird chapter-by-chapter -chapter crawl through the Lord of the Rings. Uh, and I will see you then. Thank you, Booktube.